the next talk is called um, Cycle Slicer. Cycle Slicer, an, an algorithm for building permutations on special domains. Written by Sarah Myrickle and Scott Yilek uh, from the University of um, Salt. Uh, Thomas. Saint. Thomas. St. Thomas. Saint. Sorry, St. Thomas. <laughs> Not the yeah, okay. And Sarah is giving a talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I just want to reiterate that this is joint work with Scott Yellick. Um, should this work? All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about two problems today that are related to format preserving encryption. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to start with an example. Um, so let's suppose that you have a database. Um, and you're storing millions of US social security numbers. And so these have all of the constraints that social security numbers have. Um, they're nine digit numbers. The first digits can't be six, 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 and so forth. Um, can you hear me in the back? I think maybe I'm not using the microphone. Yeah? OK, good. Thank you. All right, great. Um, so the question you might ask, um, so this is an existing database, and you want to go back and add encryption on top. OK? Um, well, so how do we do that? Uh, one approach um, is we could represent these social security numbers as 30-bit numbers, padded with zeros, and then use some sort of standard block cipher. Well, the problem with this in certain applications is that these numbers are no longer valid social security numbers. Um, they have a very different format and don't fit all those restrictions I discussed earlier. Um, so in the uh, format uh, preserving encryption schemes, um, we're looking for schemes that encrypts the social security numbers as valid social security numbers, fitting all of those constraints. All right, so this is the, the setup we're looking at here. Um, and these don't just occur with social security numbers, there are many different applications, uh, credit cards, email addresses, and so forth. Okay, so I'm gonna start today talking about some background on format preserving encryption and work that's been done in that area. Um, and I'm gonna introduce two sort of specific problems within the area of format encryp preserving encryption. <laughs> Um, then I'm going to talk about our, our cycle slicer algorithm. I'll explain where the name comes from um, and how we can use uh, this algorithm to tackle these two different problems that I'm going to introduce. Um, and then I'll very, very briefly discuss uh, some of the proofs that go behind it. So not too much since it's the last day of the conference. Um, all right, I will spare you all those details. Okay, so um, just to give a little bit of background on format preserving encryption, um, the first scheme was introduced in 97. Um, and the term itself, Format Preserving Encryption, which I'm abbreviating FPE here, uh, was coined in 08. Um, and so there's many uh, domains where we have solutions. Um, so for example, bit strings are integers up to n. Um, and there's even a standard that was published by uh, NIST Oops. Um, as well in 16. Okay, so um, one potential solution to this problem, um, so if you have a domain where there's an efficient way to rank um, your elements uh, and unrank them, um, then we can use what's called a rank and cipher unrank approach. Um, and so what happens here is if you, so you have this target set, in our example, social security numbers, and in order to encipher a point, you simply rank the point and you get an integer, then you use an existing cipher on integers, um, and then unranked to get an element that's again a social security number. So um, this is kind of one approach to handle the problem. Um, and th this approach has led to efficient algorithms in a number of domains. Um, but there's some drawbacks here. So one of the drawbacks um, is that again this requires uh, efficient ranking and unranking algorithms which not all domains have. So we're going to be specifically today looking at the setup where you don't have efficient ranking algorithms. Um, and secondly, sometimes these unranking algorithms can lead to timing of uh, can leak timing information. So sometimes even if there is an efficient ranking algorithm, you may not want to use it. Okay, so I'm gonna look at uh, one, so one way to approach this problem, um, which we're gonna, we call domain targeting. Um, and this is uh, an existing approach. Now, I think we, we came up with the name, but not the approach. Um, we're gonna, so we're gonna find a cipher um, on a larger set X. So we find a larger set that includes our target set. Um, and we're going to look at an existing cipher on this larger set, and then we're going to transform the cipher on this larger set to a cipher on our smaller set, um, S, right, our target set. Um, so if we look at back to the running example of social security numbers, um, if we consider um, X to be the set of 30 bit streams, uh, bit strings, um, there are many ciphers we can use here, um, and then that leaves us with the problem of how do we take a cipher on this larger set and turn it into a cipher on our smaller set. 
Um, and so one way to do this is called cycle walking, and this has been around for a while in the literature for a while. Um, and so the way we're going to do this in the case of cycle walking is to encrypt a particular point. Um, again, so we're, we're starting with a, a cipher on this larger set, so we can think of that as a permutation. So we have a permutation on the larger set X, and we want to um, encrypt a point on this smaller target set, and we just evaluate the permutation on this point. Now, if we get something that's in our target set, that's in S, then great, we're done. Otherwise, we just repeat. And eventually, we're either going to get back to the point itself, or we'll find uh, something that's in our target set X. Okay. Um, so uh, just to kind of explain this example a little further, and this will be helpful for the rest of the talk, um, so if we think about this from the cycle uh, structure perspective, so let's think about the cycle structure of the permutations. Um, essentially what this does is if we look at these cycles, um, and we look at the points in the cy uh, cycles that are in our target set, um, essentially it's going to basically erase all of the other points, um, and then we're left with just a permutation on our smaller target set. So this is kind of what happens from the um, uh, cycle structure perspective. Okay, so um, cycle walking was formally analyzed by Black and Rongaway in 2002. Um, and it has, uh, so if we assume that this target set is a, uh, the size of the target set is a constant fraction of the size of the overall set, then we'll end up with a small expected running time. Um, but the downside here is that the worst case running time can be um, really large. And so what happens is basically you can keep encountering points that aren't in our target set. And in the worst case, you'll encounter uh, the size of X minus the size of it. S um, points. Um, and in addition, we can have uh, different running times, which can leak, uh, time, potentially leak timing information. Okay, so um, you might ask, can we do better? Um, and actually, last year at AsiaCrip, um, I recognize a few familiar faces, I gave a talk about another algorithm that we can use um, that overcomes some of these drawbacks. Um, and so we called it reverse cycle walking. And essentially, what it does is instead of breaking um, instead of just eliminating these points um, in a cycle and creating a single cycle, we're going to break into contiguous, so we look at contiguous points in S, um, and we look at these cycles formed by contiguous points, um, and so we're going to break up basically into more cycles, um, and then we're further going to restrict and only look at cycles of size 2. Um, so basically, if we look at the cycle strike st structure of that original permutation on the set X, um, we're going to look for pairs of points in that cycle structure um, where you get a pair of points in S that are surrounded by points that are not in S. And so that's going to lead us to a matching. Okay, so we're going to end up with a matching, um, and we're going to apply this matching um, uh, to, to get our permutation on our target set. Okay. Um, so one step of uh, reverse cycle walking always takes constant time, which is nice. Um, but what you might have noticed is that it's not going to end up after one step with a random permutation. So even if we start with a random permutation on X, this is certainly not random after a single step. You'll note that many points just get mapped to themselves, right? So um, the question that comes up then is, okay, so it's not random. How many rounds of this do we need to do? So we're going to need to do um, log of the size of X rounds of this, and then we end up with a random permutation. Okay, so we've lowered the worst case running time from order n to order log n, um, but we've definitely lost the benefit of that expected uh, constant time algorithm that we had with uh, original cycle. Okay, and the other downside to this algorithm is that it performs poorly when the size of S approaches the size of um, the larger set. So what happens here is if you, again, think back to that cycle structure, um, if we have a cycle and it has many contiguous points in S, then we end up just ignoring them. Um, and so as the size of S approaches the size of the larger set, um, then we end up ignoring, really not making much progress in a single round. Okay. Um, and so we're going to see that the algorithm I'm going to talk about today is going to overcome this drawback. Okay, so that was domain targeting. Um, I'm actually, so the algorithm that I talk, I'm going to talk about today, eventually, I'll get there, uh, Cycle Slicer, um, applies to also a different problem that's also related to format preserving encryption schemes. Um, and so let me introduce this problem uh, briefly before I go back to uh, tell you about Cycle Slicer. All right, so the idea here um, is that prior to format uh, preserving encryption schemes, um, practitioners use tokenization systems. Of, um, and so essentially what that means is they would just lazily sample a random permutation, um, and they'd keep these uh, pairs in a table, um, and as needed, add to this table. 
All right, well, later on, um, an efficient or practical format preserving encryption scheme comes for their application, and they now want to start using this format preserving encryption scheme. Um, but in many cases, they can't just ignore these tables. They've already handed out uh, keys. They need to be able to preserve um, these pairs that are in the table. So the question is, how can we add a format preserving encryption scheme while preserving these existing pairs that are already there? All right, um, so let's, let me just formalize this problem a little bit further. Um, so we're given a table where we have input and output pairs. Um, and both of, or so these, these two sets, T and U, are uh, subsets of some larger set X. Um, and our goal is to, starting from a cipher on this set T, create a cipher on our set S, uh, sorry, given a, a cipher on our set X, we want to create a different cipher on site S that basically preserves these existing pairs, right? So we want to create a permutation on this whole set S that preserves this partial permutation that we're kind of forced to live with. All right. Okay, so this problem was introduced recently by Grubbs, Ristin, Fart, and Yaram in Europe 2017. Um, and they actually proposed two different solutions to this problem, and I'm going to talk about them briefly. Um, so one of them um, is actually very similar to the rank and cipher unrank algorithm that we saw before. Um, and so this is kind of a modification on that algorithm. Um, so what they do is they take um, all the points on the input side of the table, um, and they rank all those points and create a table of those ranked points. And when they go to rank a point later on, they have to do basically a binary search on this table to figure out where it fits relative to the points that are already mapped. Um, and so basically they can, can take this, and I went over that very fast, so that you, don't, you don't need to actually understand what's going on there, um, but basically it's a, a modification of this rank and cipher unrank approach um, with an added binary search on this table. Okay, um, so again, um, this is great, uh, but it has the same drawbacks that the rank and cipher unrank um, algorithm had before, um, and that they're domains where we don't have efficient ranking algorithms. Um, and it's success susceptible uh, to timing attacks, both from the binary search aspect and from the ranking uh, side of it. Okay, so they, they also introduced um, another algorithm, which is in some ways analogous to uh, cycle walking. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really neat how it works. Uh, and it only requires the ability to test membership. So essentially what happens is, um, if, if you think about this problem, right, we have this table of existing pairs. Um, and so what you can end up with is you can have uh, points that exist either only in the output column of the table or only in the input column of the table. And so we have to be really careful how we handle those points. Um, and so if you have, if you try to encrypt a point just using your permutation in X, um, and it maps to something that's only in the output column of the table, um, we, we have to be careful. We can't just then again use our permutation on X because that point that's only in the output column, it's, it, that point itself also has to have somewhere where it gets mapped to. Um, so um, cycle walking breaks down. Um, so instead what they do is they take that point, they look at the matching input point, and then they look at where that gets mapped to. So they kind of do this zigzag thing. Um, and it's, it's quite nice. Uh, OK, but again, like cycle walking, it has similar drawbacks. So you end up with um, expected constant time, but order n in the worst case for similar reasons. Um, so we're going to talk about a way we can overcome this worst case. OK, so finally, <laughs> I'm going to talk about our algorithm. Um, which I'm going to call Psycho Slicer. So I'm going to start by talking about it um, at a high level, and then I'll show how we can apply it to the domain targeting and the domain completion problem. Okay, so at a high level, we're going to take a permutation um, on some set. Uh, we're going to go from this permutation to a matching, um, and then we're going to take this matching, and we're only going to keep certain edges in the matching. So we're going to define um, what we call an inclusion function, um, and it's going to be different for the domain targeting and for the domain completion. Um, and so we're going to take this algorithm, we're going to take this matching and break it up. Um, okay, so the name comes from how we go from this permutation to the matching. Um, and what happens is we're going to take the cycles in the matching and we're going to break them up. Okay, um, and so each, each point um, in the cycle is going to flip a bit and it's going to create a direction. Um, and if these directions match, um, so, for example, 7 and 4 are pointing towards each other, then we're going to include that edge in our matching. Okay, so we can take a large cycle and break it up into a certain 
uh, number of pairs, right? Just using these direction functions, and if the direction functions match, then we keep that edge. If they don't, um, then we don't keep that edge. Okay, so we're gonna break these cycles up. Okay, so in domain targeting, this is a pretty straightforward to apply this algorithm. Um, we're simply going to um, only keep edges where both endpoints are in our target set. So if you think back to that cycle slicer, uh, that cycle structure example, um, when we get these large continuous cycles that are all in S, instead of just ignoring them, we're going to break them up and just keep certain edges within that cycle. Okay, so um, in terms of advantages, again, it, right, so over the rank and cipher and rank approaches, this is only going to require the ability to test membership. We get the lower worst case. So these are all the same um, advantages that reverse cycle walking had. Um, but the additional advantage is that we're going to end up with better performance when these sizes um, of the steps are close and we have some, some information on um, uh, the uh, you know, improvement we get in the social security example. Um, and so this, uh, right, so we have to be a little bit careful because we don't want to cheat too much. Um, and so it actually is more efficient with reverse cycle walking if we use a larger set X. Instead of uh, 2 to the 30, we use 2 to the 32. Um, and so then we, we get a probably more honest improvement factor of a quarter. Um, OK, so uh, let me talk about how we can apply it to this domain completion setting. Um, so in this case, um, again, we're, we have this table. Um, and we need to preserve these table pairs. Um, and so to help understand the algorithm, let's think about the cycle structure of the table. right? So the table is like a partial permutation. right? We have these pairs of input-output pairs. Um, we have these input-output pairs. Um, and so this basically, we get um, cycles, we get single points, right? things that aren't in the table at all. Um, and then we get lines. Okay? So we have um, cycles, single points, and lines. And so what our algorithm is going to do conceptually, if we take a step back from the details, um, is we're going to basically ignore any cycles. Okay? So if our table has cycles, then we're not, that's already a complete you know, permutation on those points. We can ignore them. So we ignore the cycles. Um, and we're going to take any lines and we're going to condense them down to a single point. Okay, so if we have any lines, our table has any lines, we condense them down to a single point. Um, and then we're going to basically find a matching or um, find a permutation. We're going to find a permutation on this strange set, right? So we ignore cycles, we collapse the points to a line. Um, and then we're going to find a permutation on this set, and then we'll expand the lines back out, add back in the cycles, and it gets up to permutation on the original set. Okay, so at a high level, that's what we're doing. We're collapsing the lines, ignoring the cycles, getting a permutation on, the, on this strange set, um, and then adding back in our cycles and expanding our lines. Okay, so this sounds straightforward enough. The implementation details are a bit tricky to get this to work, um, especially since we want to be able to evaluate it for a single point, right? We don't know what's happening. We don't get this overall uh, large view. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, well, uh, what we're going to do, and let me uh, maybe spare you the details of the, um, okay, so, so I'll talk about it briefly. Um, okay, so, so we have a point, um, and if the point is in, in T, so if it's basically in the um, input side, then we're done, right? So if we already have a matching in the table, we can ignore it. Um, if we don't, then what we do is we do basically a little bit of pre-processing. Um, and if the point is in the output side of the table, but it's not on the input side of the table, then for these points, these are the points that are at the end of the lines, we basically want to map them to the first point in the line. So if it's, in the, if it's the last point in the line, we map it to the first point in the line, and then we run cycle slicer. And for every other point, we just run cycle slicer like normal. Um, and right, uh, uh, what's nice about this is that this first, and we'll also need last if we want to go the other way, um, we can pre-compute these functions and store them with the table. Um, okay, so, um, and then the inclusion function, we're only going to keep edges in the matching if both <coughs> points are in x minus. Alright? Okay, so um, advantages of this um, is that, we're again, we're only required to test membership. We can pre-compute first and last. Um, this is going to lower the worst case running time from O of n to O of log n. Um, and, and note that I, I haven't talked to you at all about where we get this log n, um, because again, right, just like with reverse cycle slicer, uh, rever sorry, reverse cycle walking, we, uh, we have to do run multiple steps of this, right? So a single step is not going to give us a random permutation. We have to run many steps, and so we have to analyze that process. Um, 
and it's, it's no longer an expected uh, time algorithm, and we get some of the other benefits that we had with reverse cycle walking. All right, so in the last couple minutes, I'm just going to talk briefly about this um, question of uh, analyzing this. So um, we have a proof of correctness as well, while our algorithm actually generates a, a, a random permutation. Um, but the, the more interesting part, I think, of the proof is this question of how many rounds of cycle slicer do we need? Um, and this question is similar to a question that came up when we were analyzing reverse cycle walking. Um, and essentially, you can think about these problems as we're applying a matching at each step. And so how many steps do we need before we end up with this random permutation? Um, and so in order to answer that question, um, we showed that essentially, right, again, we can think of this as a Markov chain. At each step, we're applying a matching. And how many times do we have to run it before we end up with a random permutation? Um, and this is uh, something that's called a, a matching exchange process. Um, and more formally, a matching exchange process, we're going to pick a number according to some distribution. Then we're going to generate a random permutation of that size um, uh, and apply that at every step. Uh, a different permutation or a different matching at each step. Um, and this uh, Sumaj and Kudalowski um, called this a matching exchange process and they uh, analyzed it in 2000. And so we're able to, to really borrow a lot from their analysis. Um, but one of the downsides to their analysis we encountered when we were looking at reverse cycle walking um, is that they give asymptotic results and aren't really interested in the constants involved in this. Um, and so in the context of reverse cycle walking, we were able to give some explicit uh, bounds on these constants um, and in this case we were able to generalize those and apply them in other settings too. Those, those bounds were very specific to reverse cycle walking so um, we were able to, to generalize those for this particular application. Alright so um, this is just kind of a formal discussion or formal uh, definition of a matching exchange process um, but it's relatively straightforward to show that both of these algorithms, cycle slicer in the context of domain targeting and in the context of domain completion, yield a matching exchange process and then use some of these techniques that were developed previously to analyze how long it's going to take. All right, um, so that was, that was the algorithm. Uh, in terms of future directions, um, you know, a lot of this analysis, we, we did some work on trying to come up with these constant bounds, but I, I think they're definitely artifacts of the proof, not of the actual algorithm itself. So um, there's definitely improvement to be had there. Um, I also sort of hided, uh, or hid, hid one uh, particular detail, which is that um, after we pick out our matching, we're then flipping a bit for each of the uh, edges in the matching to determine if we're keeping it or not, which I think is really probably not necessary. But again, an artifact of the proof techniques is that we need that that extra bit of randomness there to make it go the coupling argument go through. Um, and then, um, you know, at the end of this, it still leaves me personally rather unsatisfied because that constant running time, expected time that you get from the zigzag algorithm and reverse or, and cycle walking is just so appealing that um, it'd be lovely to find a way to balance those two out without having to take that worst case uh, penalty. All right. Thank you. much more complicated if they're no longer independent, but maybe if we can you know, make some sort of assumptions that they're close to independent or roughly close, we could build that into the bounds. So, be a good thing to look at. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. So, uh, when you make uh, one round, I, I think you can trace where the single point goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you when you make the R, R rounds, is it the case that you need to 
trace the positions of all elements? No, you can trace a single point through all the rounds. Because um, you're, you're flop, you know which position you're swapping with, and so you can trace it through the entire R round. Yeah, but that, when you apply this, this, the same, OK, you, you know to which position you go, but then the other point, uh, if, 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 if you were calculating the trajectory of the other point, it went possibly to this, this point. Yeah, I mean, so if we, it is possible to trace a single point, but it's it's complicated to keep. But we are, you know, we're keeping track that because of the the bit flips, which determine where they get matched and which position it's moving towards. Um, the way those are chosen, you you can you can trace where a single point goes, because um, it really just depends. You just care where you don't care what point is at the position you're swapping it with. You just care where you're where you're moving it to, um, and what the bit flip for the, that pair is. I think we can talk more offline too if that didn't answer the question. Okay, thank you so much.